Hello, friends. Welcome to Reverend Elation Radio. In 1920, a minister named Dr. Bolgan was a renowned Bible lecturer who became famous for a message he gave in Spokane at St. Paul's Methodist Church. In this message, he denounced John G. Lake and those who believe in divine healing. And then he claimed that his lectures that he gave would, quote, burn up the infidels, their standards, and their cults. And he would use that kind of language about people who believed in divine healing and about John G. Lake. Now, John G. Lake then writes a response to him. And this is a pretty long response, but you see how this man who was a world-renowned, famous Bible lecturer, you might think with the language like that, that Lake would come out with guns blazing, with teeth sharpened, trying to really score points. But I was so impressed by how he began and how he made his arguments. And it really shows this part of John G. Lake that we don't really always get to see in those who specialize in the supernatural gifts of healing or prophecy, when there's the scholarly side, when they have ordered thoughts and are trying to make an argument and make logical points, they can't do that to everybody. Not everyone's going to follow maybe some of the complex concepts and things like that. Um, but when you would hear him speak to somebody who he, you can tell he has respect for him and love of Christ in his heart for him, but the other person still seems and makes themselves to be an enemy. So I want you to hear how John G. Lake responded to his message and to the claims like this. Then at the end, we'll talk about it a little bit. John G. Lake writes to Dr. Elwood Bulgan in Spokane, Washington. Dear Brother in Christ, it was my privilege to be present at your meeting at the St. Paul Methodist Church at Spokane last Monday night and listen to your sermon. I was deeply impressed by the masterful manner in which you marshaled your facts and the spirit in which they were presented to your great audience. Lake continues, Your presentation of the deity of Jesus Christ and the sharpness with which you brought the facts of the denial of the deity of Jesus by the Christian scientists were striking. The masterful handling of the whole subject commanded my admiration, and I believe the admiration of a great majority of your audience. Men can speak with frankness to each other, particularly when their interest in the kingdom of Jesus Christ is identical. You have lived, loved, and denied yourself and suffered for the cause of the kingdom of Christ in the earth. I, too, have loved and suffered for my fidelity to the vision of the redemption of Jesus Christ, which God revealed to me. Lake says, for 25 years I have labored, as few men in the world have labored for so long a period, to bring before the world as far as I could the magnificent truths of the redemptive blood and life and power of the Son of God. Your methods and my methods have been different. You, in your forceful, philosophical manner, have undertaken to destroy faith in Christian science through opposition, ridicule, and exposure of what you believe to be its fallacies. On the other hand, I've undertaken by specific revelation of the truth of Jesus Christ concerning the healing power of God and its availability for all men today to show the world that there's no need for any man to leave any stable Christian body in order to secure the benefits of salvation and healing specifically declared by Jesus Christ himself to be available for every man. Jesus, in contrast with the ancient philosophers and reformers of the past and present, first gave himself in consecration to God, body, soul, and spirit, thereby establishing the pattern consecration for all Christians forever. His baptism was the dedication and commitment of himself unto all righteousness. He undertook to reveal the righteousness of God. Note the nature of this revelation. Having definitely committed himself, his body, his soul, his spirit, to God forever, 
immediately there descended upon him the witness to his hundredfold consecration. The Holy Ghost came from heaven as a dove and abode upon him, as it ever will upon every man who will meet Almighty God with the same utterances of real consecration to God of spirit, soul, and body. This reveals the demand of God upon the Christian's person and conscience and the answer of God from heaven to this fullness of consecration. Being thus definitely equipped, he proceeded to the wilderness for testing by Satan to see if this consecration of body and soul and spirit would endure. He overcame all the efforts of Satan to tempt him in the specific departments of his life, first the body, second the soul, and third the spirit. He overcame through reliance on God and his word and came forth in the power of the spirit. He announced the constructive platform of his life and ministry containing the following six planks. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me, first, to preach the gospel to the poor, second, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, third, to preach deliverance to the captives, fourth, recovering of sight to the blind, fifth, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and sixth, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. God's acceptable year had come. No more waiting for the year of jubilee and all its consequent blessings. God's never-ending jubilee was at hand in Jesus Christ. He then went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And so established forever the ideal of Christian ministry for the church of God. Then he empowered twelve men and sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Profiting by their experience and advancing in faith and knowledge of the power of God, he called seventy others also. But in sending forth the seventy, he reversed the order of instruction. To the seventy, he said, go into the cities round about, heal the sick that are therein, and say to them, the kingdom of God is come near to you. And they returned rejoicing that even the devils were subject to them through thy name. Then came his wonderful entrance into death, his redemption on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, his interviews with the disciples, his last commission in which, according to Mark, he established in the church of Christ to be born through their preaching in all the world the very same ministry of salvation and healing that he himself during his earth life had practiced. That ministry contained the message of Jesus to all the world and the anointing with power from on high, just as he had received at his baptism. Indeed, he commanded them to wait in Jerusalem until you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He declared to them that certain signs should follow, saying, These signs shall follow them that believe. Every one, every Christian soul, was thus commissioned by Jesus to heal the sick and sinful from sickness. And in my name they shall first cast out devils, second they shall speak with new tongues, third they will take up serpents, fourth and if they drink any deadly things it shall not hurt them, fifth They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. The same Holy Spirit of God which flowed through Jesus Christ, the anointing that was upon him and which flowed through his hands and into the sick, was an impartation of God so real that when the woman touched the hem of his garment, she was conscious of the instant effect of the healing in her body through it. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. While Jesus himself was likewise conscious of an outflow, he said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out of me. Divine healing is the particular phase of ministry in which the modern church does not measure up to the early church. 
This failure has been due to a real lack of knowledge of the real nature and the real process of Christian healing. The above incident reveals the secret of what the power was, how the power operated, and by what law it was transmitted from the disciple to the one who needed the blessing. The power was the Holy Ghost of God, both in Jesus Christ after his baptism in the Holy Ghost and in the disciples after the baptism of the Holy Ghost came upon them on the day of Pentecost. It flowed through the hands of Jesus to the sick. It permeated the garments he wore. When the woman touched even the hem of his garment, there was sufficient of the power of God there for her need. The disciples healed the sick by the same method. Indeed, the Apostle Paul, realizing this law, permitted the people to bring to him handkerchiefs and aprons that they might touch his body, and when they were carried to the sick, the sick were healed through the power of God in the handkerchiefs, and the demons that inhabited their persons went out of them. Late continues, Herein is shown the secret of the early church that which explains the whole miracle-working power of the apostles and the early church for 400 years. The same is evident in branches of the modern church. Herein is revealed the secret that has been lost. That secret is the conscious, tangible, living, incoming, abiding, outflowing Spirit of God through the disciple of Christ who has entered into blood-washed relationship and baptism in the Holy Ghost. This is the secret that the modern church, from the days of the Reformation onward, has failed to reveal. We have, however, retained a form of godliness, but have denied the power thereof. When Jesus laid his hands on people, the Holy Ghost was imparted to them in healing power. When the disciples and early Christians likewise laid their hands on the sick, the Holy Ghost was imparted through them to the needy one. Likewise, the Holy Ghost was imparted to preachers for the work of the ministry, including healing. Primitive church history abounds in examples of healing in the same manner. Paul specifically enjoins Timothy to forget not the gift power that's in you that came through the laying on of my hands. It was a baptism of the Holy Ghost that came upon them on the day of Pentecost. It was an impartation of the Holy Ghost to Timothy for the work of Christian ministry. In the whole range of church history, we have retained the form, but have lost its power in a great degree. The Pope lays his hands on the head of the bishops, the bishop lays his hands on the head of the priest, and the priest lays his hands on the head of the communicants when he receives them as members of the church. In the Protestant church, in all her branches, the laying on of hands in ordination for the ministry is practiced. But in the early church, it wasn't the laying on of hands alone, but through the laying on of hands, the impartation of the definite, living spirit of the living God to the individual took place. Through its power in him, he was constituted a real priest, a real elder, a real preacher with grace, healing power, and faith, anointed of God from on high. God gave the blood of Jesus to the Christian church. God gave the power of healing to the Christian church in the Holy Ghost, And as long as they lived under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and exercised the faith of Jesus in their hearts, the healing power of God manifested and is still manifest where this condition exists. Christian science exists because of the failure of the Christian church to truly present Jesus Christ and his power through the Spirit and minister it to the world. Robert G. Ingersoll assailed the Holy Scriptures, laughed at the Christian God, destroyed the faith of men, wrecked their hopes, and left them stranded and abandoned amid the wreckage. Through this means, he brought the just condemnation of the world upon himself. 
The world condemns him to this hour in that he destroyed the faith of men without supplying to their souls something to take its place, as he should have done, and as any man who is honorable and true must do. You recommend a divine healing in one breath and deny it its potency in the next. You've attacked Christian science, the followers of Dowie, and others, and arraigned them at the bar and condemned them, without giving to men a tangible way by which the healing of God might be brought to them. Why do you not study and practice Jesus Christ's own way of healing and so make your ministry constructive? What are you going to do with the multitude of dying that the doctors cannot help? Leave them to die? The doctors have got through with them? And in many instances, even though they're still prescribing for them and are perfectly aware of their inability to heal the sick ones and are candid and willing to say so, Dr. Bulgan, what have you got for these? What have you given to these? If a man were walking down the street with a very poor set of crutches and a ruffian came along and kicked the crutches from under him and let him fall, Every honest soul would rise in condemnation of that ruffian's act and demanded reparation. You come to the dying, kick their hope out from under them, and let them fall to the ground and leave them there to die without bringing them the true healing power in the blood and spirit of Jesus. It's not sufficient to say, I believe in divine healing. If they are sick, they must be healed. Lake continues, This must not be construed as a defense of Christian science. It's not given with that thought nor in that spirit. It is rather given in the hope that as an influential man in the Christian church, you may see the weakness of your position and of the position of the church, and by the grace of God call the church back again to faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God for healing for every man from every disease as Jesus Christ intended it should be and as the scriptures definitely, positively teach, and make proper scriptural provision for a definite healing ministry. In the hope of supplying this need of the church, the Protestant ministers of the city of Los Angeles have agreed in formal resolution to begin the teaching and study and practice of healing. How has this come to pass and why? They've been whipped into it by the success of Christian science. A recent issue of the New York Daily Paper announces that pastors of New York have likewise undertaken to teach the people the power of God to heal. The Protestant Episcopal Church is endeavoring through the ministry of a layman of the Church of England from the old country, Mr. Hickson, to educate their people in the truth of healing through the atonement of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, by the laying on of hands and the prayer of faith. In a few days, the gentleman will appear at All Saints Cathedral in Spokane for that purpose, and the sick will be invited to be ministered to in the name of the Son of God and healed through his blood purchase. The Church of England in England and also in Africa for 10 years have been endeavoring to organize societies not to teach their people Christian science, psychic therapeutics, or mental healing, all of which belong to the realm of the natural, but to teach and demonstrate the pure power of God from heaven by the Holy Ghost, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, to heal diseases. Frank Reale, a secretary of the Presbyterian Board of Education in New York, with 63 universities and colleges under his control and supervision, is the author of a remarkable book, The Sinless, Sickless, Deathless Life in which he recounts in a chapter entitled How the Light and the Fire Fell, the marvelous story of his own conversion. He was the minister of the gospel and a graduate of Harvard. He found his Lord at the hands of an Indian in Dakota. He tells of the light of God that came to his soul in sanctifying power through the ministry of a Salvation Army officer, Colonel Brengel. He relates his marvelous healing when a diseased and dying wreck through the reading of a religious tract on healing and his experience in seeing many healed of all manner of diseases by the power of God. You are a Presbyterian, my brother. You need not go out of your own church for the truth of God concerning healing. The question before the church, 
now that the break toward healing has come, and it has come, is who is prepared to teach and demonstrate the truth of God concerning healing. Will it be a fact that in the absence of knowledge of God by the ministry of the church in her blindness and ignorance and helplessness be overwhelmed by Christian science, new thought, and the thousand and one cults which teach psychological healing? Where's the prophet of God who should come forward, teach and demonstrate the pure spiritual value and power of the Holy Ghost, secured for men because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave his blood to get it for them? Is it not time that such men as yourself arise in the dignity of Christ and throw off the shackles of formal religion and by the grace of God enter into the real life of living power through the Son of God in the Holy Ghost and rescue the church out of her present degradation, reestablishing forever divine healing on its true and scriptural basis, the atonement of Jesus Christ. 25 years ago, the light concerning healing came to my soul. After four brothers and four sisters had died of diseases, and when four other members of the family were in a dying state, abandoned by the physicians as hopeless, and after my father had spent a fortune trying to obtain human help. One man of God who had the truth of God in his heart came to the rescue. All four sick ones were healed. I was an ardent Methodist. I loved my church. My parents were members of an old Scotch Presbyterian Kirk. The Presbyterian Church had no light on the subject of healing. The Methodist Church had no light on the subject of healing. I received my light through a man who had been educated in the University of Edinburgh and had been a minister of the Congregational Church. He knew the power of God to save and the power of God to heal. When I accepted this blessed truth and saw my family healed out of death, what was the attitude of the church? Just what the attitude of all the leading churches has been. When I declared this truth before our conferences, she undertook to ostracize me. And from that day to this, many of her ministry, who have prayed through to God and secured the blessing of power of God upon their soul to heal the sick, have been forced out of ministry. Dr. Bulgan, it's time to quit attacking forms of faith, whether good or bad and turn your attention and the attention of the church to the only thing that will deliver her out of her present wretchedness and inability to bless, and bring her back again to Christ, to the foot of the cross, to the blood of Jesus, to the Holy Ghost from on high, to the power of God, and the real faith, including healing, once for all, delivered to the saints. Through this healing ministry, the church at Spokane reports 100,000 healings by the power of God through five years of continuous daily efforts and the kindred blessed fact that the majority of those healed were saved from sin also. Late continues, The dying world is stretching out her hands for help. The church, on account of her laxness in this matter, opens the doors for the existence of Christian science and the thousand and one worn-out philosophies that follow in her train. Let the manhood of the church arise. Take the place of the prophet of God. Call her back to the ministry of real salvation. A blessed salvation not alone for men after they are dead or that will give them bliss in heaven when they die, but to a salvation that gives eternal life in Christ health for the mind, and health for the body, and supplies likewise the power of God for the immediate need, for the need of the sick, for the need of the sinful, the wretched and dying and sin-cursed and disease-smitten. Let the church return in the glory of God and the power of Christ to the original faith as clearly demonstrated in the New Testament, as perpetuated forever in the church through the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, demonstrating beyond controversy that as long as the Holy Spirit is in the church, so long are the gifts of the Holy Spirit not only present, but exercisable through faith. See the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. 
For to one is given the Spirit, first, the word of wisdom, second, the word of knowledge, third, faith by the same Spirit, fourth, the gifts of healing, fifth, the working of miracles, sixth, to another prophecy, seventh, to another discerning of spirits, eighth, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and ninth, to another the interpretation of tongues. The unchanging order of government, spiritual endowment, and ministry of the gifts of the Spirit are further declared as follows. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. When the church exercises these gifts, then she may condemn Christian science, Taoism, or New Thought. Then she may condemn every other philosophical cult. Then she may condemn Unitarianism and everything also that you preach against. Though she will not need to. Jesus never did. There were just as many strange philosophies in his day as in ours. The constructive righteousness of Christ the presence of the living Son of God to save and heal, the revelation to the world of his divine power will stop the mouths of every ism and manifest one glorious, triumphant, all-embracing power of God through Jesus Christ, his Son, and its everlasting superiority. Neither will you be compelled as you glorify doctors, medicines, surgery, etc., when the greatest physicians on earth have deplored their inability to deliver the world from its cure of sickness, then you can not only teach the theory of the atonement of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but demonstrate its reality and power to save both soul and body. All the abstract criticism in the world is powerless to stop the drift from the churches to Christian science, as long as Christian science heals the sick and the church does not. Men and women demand to be shown. When the authority of Jesus to forgive sins was challenged, he met the challenge with the healing of the palsied man, not with negotiations and criticisms. He said, Whether it's easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that you may know, I say, Arise and walk. He was too big for abstract criticism. So must the Christian and the church become. Your brother in Christ, John G. Lake, founder of the Divine Healing Institute, the Rookery Building in Spokane, Washington. Wow. Look at John G. Lake respond like that. I could only imagine. I wish we knew maybe the response that Mr. Bolgan would have had in response to that. When he saw that minister using anger, using slander, using harsh words to criticize and lump things all together in a negative way, Lake responds with respect and appreciation of the positive things and calls him, not criticizing him, calls him to this higher place, calls him into this unity of all under Christ and in his church, and saying, let's not just point out problems. Let's bring a solution. And then he says, when you bring the solution, you won't even have to point out the problems because the people will know the difference. John G. Lake continues to impress me. And surprise me in some times, because with the words he was using, wouldn't it have been a little more satisfying if you would have came with all guns blazing, just really going for a criticism? But he did what I imagine Christ was really like to those who really had a heart for God, but were wrong. He came with love. He came with respect and then showing this higher way, leading them into that way. Now, after repeated, if they were in a discussion back and forth uh, for weeks, and if they'd never found common ground, and if he kept being critical, Dr. Bulgan, then I imagine it could have got more heated, perhaps. But just hearing his this explanation of an invitation, even if Bulgan ended up not being affected by it at all, 
Lake at least here, and this is what a lot of us end up having to do. We might not even change the immediate person's mind that we're talking to. But by formulating this idea of truth spoken in love, which is not a phrase that means be mean or correct somebody, truth spoken in love is the gospel truth that is awesome. And it's spoken with this idea of love. And he did this right here. And if we can see that what he did was just lay this out in scripture as he understood it, where even if Bulgan disagreed, he would still know that Lake is not this heretic, that he wouldn't be lumped in with some of the other spiritualities that were fighting against them and that weren't showing the power and reality of Christ. And he offers this hand to say, this is for the world. It's God's love for the world. This is for the kingdom. And I think that was really great. That inspired me. And Lord Jesus, I hope right now in heaven, you just give John G. Lake a great big hug for me. Give him a high five. <laughs> and, um, and may we all look here and see how he presented this, how he put his ideas together, how he laid out his heart against one who was highly respected, highly celebrated, and who was a person that was respected for studying the Bible, but he was just wrong on this one little thing. We need to do, I need to do that. It's something that we can all step into because when it's about what Jesus did, when it's about God's love, when it's about the healing of the world that comes free so people can know who God actually really is instead of the ideas that, that bad Christians or imperfect Christians or failures of people who were hurt by Christians, whatever the, the reputation that is out in the world that most Christian people would say, that's not the church. That's, we make mistakes. There's errors. We're struggling, but we're not how it's portrayed. This true message to show people how God truly is and how his love is so they can have a good reason and good, accurate portrayal to be able to decide if they want to love him and join him or not. That's something we can all learn to do, and it must be spoken in love, and it must be true. And as much as we need to, we could take those swords and put them back into plowshares and get back to that work of sowing seed and letting God bring the increase. And maybe we put our claws away and just lay those hands and let the Holy Spirit bring them love, bring them peace, and bring them healing that they need and that God wants for him. Thanks so much for being with me today. I love you, and the Lord loves you. We'll see you next time.